let's analyze the probably most iconic weapon in video game history, its little brother, the Doom Plasma Rifle. Does a plasma rifle make sense or is it just sci-fi nonsense? The initial idea was to analyze the feasibility of creating an actual plasma gun, but it looks like someone beat me to it with about 60 years. So let's try to determine the specific technology used for the Doom plasma rifle, based on what we know from the game. To do that, we first need to know what plasma is. Plasma is one of the four states of matter. We have the three regular boring states, solid, liquid and gas. And then we have the cool fourth state that your middle school teacher didn't bother to tell you about, plasma. Plasma is a state in which the matter has been partially or completely ionized, resulting in a cloud of ions and free electrons. Matter transitions to this state when it acquires enough energy for electrons to start escaping the atoms or molecules. This can be achieved by heating up the matter to very high temperatures. For example, a lightning strike heats up the air enough to create plasma. By discharging a high voltage capacitor through a spark gap, you can create plasma. The amount of energy needed to create a certain amount of plasma depends on the matter used. Helium gas requires less energy to create plasma than air, for example. So what do we know about the ammunition of the plasma rifle? We know that it uses ammunition that is referred to as cells, and to me they look like pure energy storage devices, so I'm going to assume that is all that they are. If that is the case, the gas that is turned into plasma is the gas that happens to surround the rifle at the time of use, which would be air in Doom 2. Now let's figure out the amount of energy required to create one plasma bolt. We need to increase the temperature of the air enough to ionize the molecules and create plasma. Now complete ionization does not occur at one specific temperature. As the temperature increases, the degree of ionization increases. But at about 10,000 Kelvin it should be more or less completely ionized. Air has a specific heat capacity of 0.717 kJ per kilogram Kelvin. It means that heating up 1 kg of air 1 Kelvin, or 1 degree Celsius, requires 0.717 kJ of energy. Let's estimate the volume of a single plasma ball to about the size of a football, which is about 5000 cubic centimeters. This volume, times the density of air at 1.2 kg per cubic meter, gives us a mass of about 6 grams. Now we need to heat up these 6 grams to 10,000 Kelvin. Assuming we were fighting demons at a comfortable 26.85 degrees Celsius, we get the following equation, which tells us that creating one plasma bolt requires about 41.7 kilojoules of energy. This is about the same amount of energy as in three AA batteries. With one energy cell we can fire 20 plasma bolts, so we can estimate the amount of energy in one energy cell to about 800 kilojoules, equivalent of a small motorcycle battery. The energy pack contains 5 times the amount of energy, about 4000 kilojoules, which is equivalent of a large car battery. Now in practice there would probably be a significant amount of energy losses, which would increase the amount of required energy substantially. So now we know how to create plasma, now we need to find a way to launch it. We can probably exclude conventional explosive propulsion, as the plasma rifle only uses up cells when fired, which we assume to be nothing but energy storage devices. But since plasma consists of free electrons and ions, it conducts electricity, which means that we can propel it using the Lorentz force by subjecting it to a magnetic field, which is exactly what a railgun does, which does kind of match the long rectangular shape of the plasma rifle. A railgun usually consists of two metal plates with a conductive payload between them. As current passes through the plates and through the payload, a magnetic field is created. The payload acts according to the Lorentz force, or the left hand rule that no one seems to remember the order of. The direction of the magnetic field is indicated with your index finger. The direction of the current, in this case through the payload, is indicated with your bad word finger. And when a conductor, through which the current flows, is placed in a magnetic field, the Lorentz force acts upon it, in the direction indicated with your thumb. Now there is a problem with this concept. The payload we are trying to launch is not a solid projectile, it's a plasma cloud. Its mechanical properties are very similar to gas, which will disperse if it gets the chance, which is most likely what will happen when ejecting the plasma from a railgun. But if we look at the projectile from the plasma rifle, we see that it travels great distances without diffusing. How is that possible? Well, you might find the answer to that among your childhood memories. Remember these?
Coming across one of these as a kid, it was fascinating how far you could launch a gust of air, and how accurate it was. If you try to focus the airflow through your mouth when exhaling, the airstream will have diffused enough to cover your entire hand just a few decimeters away from your face. And with this thing, you could easily hit something 5 meters away. So how does it achieve that? Well, every time it is fired, it creates a toroidal vortex, or as the physicists call it, a donut, in which the air travels. It is formed when the flow is greater in the center of the projectile than at the edge. Because of the resulting difference in pressure between the air in motion and the static air surrounding it, the air in the projectile will flow in the shape of a donut as it travels forward. These donuts have very nice projectile properties. They do not disperse easily, the static air around the projectile has higher pressure than the constant flowing air in the donut, which causes the surrounding air to push against the projectile on all sides, helping it maintain its shape. A toroidal vortex also reduces the friction against the static air, allowing it to maintain its kinetic energy for longer. So, how do we get a railgun to create a toroidal vortex? If we replace the two parallel plates with one large cylinder and one smaller cylinder placed inside the large cylinder, we get a symmetrical acceleration around the roll axis. The current flows from the large cylinder to the small cylinder through the payload, just like on a regular railgun. But as you can see, the surface of the large cylinder is much greater than the surface of the small cylinder. This causes the current density to increase closer to the small cylinder, which in turn increases the Lorentz force, and thereby the acceleration of the gas closer to the small cylinder. This gives us the following acceleration pattern. And this is exactly what we want. In order to create the toroidal vortex, the flow needs to be greater at the center of the projectile, which is just what we get with this design. Now, the clever part with this design is that the plates used to accelerate the plasma can also be used to create the plasma. A high ionization voltage can be applied between the plates to ionize the air. Once the air assumes the state of plasma, it becomes a conductor, and as current flows through it, it will be accelerated in the resulting magnetic field, launching it towards your enemies. Before I started this research project, I thought that the plasma rifle was just a theoretical concept that made for a cool futuristic weapon. I was not expecting to find countless research papers spanning well over half a century. The plasma gun is very much a real thing, but it's not used the way you might expect. Life on Earth. Possible because of the great plasma ball in the sky. More specifically, the nuclear fusion that releases the energy that life on Earth depends on. Now, we have figured out how to use this to destroy stuff, but not how to harvest energy in a controlled way. Yet. The first problem you face when trying to create a fusion reactor is how to contain a plasma cloud that is as hot as the sun. The Soviets solved this in the 50s, they created the tokamak. It uses magnetic fields to contain the plasma, and it just happens to be in the shape of a donut. The second problem is, how do you fuel it? You need a way to inject the plasma as it is running. And that is where the plasma gun comes in. You need a way to launch the plasma with enough force to pass through the magnetic field barrier into the confinement. And this is just what the plasma gun does. Third problem is how to make it self-sustained, how to get more power out than you put in. This is a problem yet to be solved. The closest so far is from the joint European donut that has managed to produce an output power of 16 megawatts using 24 megawatts of input power. There has also been several attempts to weaponize this technology, and the probably closest we have gotten to an actual plasma rifle, at least that we are aware of, is through the Marauder project. Marauder standing for Magnetically Accelerated Ring to Achieve Ultra High Direct Energy and Radiation. The goal, as the name suggests, is to launch a plasma donut at high speed. 
Computer simulations were published in 1990 with a design utilizing the Shiva Star, a 10 megajoule capacitor bank, as the energy source for the device. The result from the experiments that followed was published in 1993. Coincidence? I think not. Whether or not these experiments resulted in the implementation of a plasma weapon is not publicly declared. I guess we might find out if our visit to Mars doesn't go as planned. A notable difference between the Marauder and the Doom plasma rifle is that the Marauder is designed to accelerate a small amount of plasma to a very high speed, delivering the destructive power mainly through kinetic energy, just like most non-explosive projectile weapons, while the Doom plasma rifle fires a larger amount of plasma at a relatively low speed, delivering the destructive power mainly through the thermal energy. Comparing this conclusion with the original Doom manual, it seems like we are indeed frying some demon butt.